The inaugural ACC-SEC Challenge matchups were released on Wednesday, and it's a reminder of what a massive role TV contracts play in scheduling basketball games. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. Yes, even all summer long, Andy and I and our wonderful guests are coming at you. We want to thank you for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen or watch every single day. Coming up on today's show, we're going to take a look at the 14 games of this inaugural ACC SEC. Andy, I'm so used to ACC Big Ten Challenge. I got to like focus in on that. Every <laughs> it time. sounds weird when you say it. I agree. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> and then we'll give you some big picture takeaways. And so uh, that'll be great. But don't worry. We're not going to dwell too long on like Notre Dame at South Carolina, with all due respect to both of those teams, we'll, we'll, we'll hit big picture stuff and it'll be fun. By the way, as a reminder, before we get into starting with Tuesday's slate of seven games, here's why this is happening and why I said what I did off the top about the TV contracts. Previously, we've had for like two decades, the ACC Big Ten Challenge, and for the last 10 years, the SEC Big 12 Challenge. Now we're going to go a little bit more in depth into those things in a little bit, but uh, a little reminder off the top of why this new challenge exists. The Big Ten has brokered their new media TV deal, and it no longer includes ESPN. Now it'll be like kind of an amalgamation. Yeah, I said amalgamation of Fox <laughs> and CBS and NBC. And these matchups are a product of ESPN networks. So Big Ten's out. So we got to find some new things. And also the Big 12 and SEC had decided to end their challenge. So let's put together these two Southern conferences, which geographically really aren't that anymore, but you get the bigger <laughs> point and move on. So here's what we're going to do in this first chunk of time, the A block, we call it. We're going to dive into Tuesday night's slate of seven games. There's 15 teams in the ACC, 14 in the SEC, seven each night, and one team gets left out. We're going to hide that for now, and uh, you can be listening and see if you can guess who it is, but we'll talk about it later. So, Andy, at 7 o'clock Eastern time on Tuesday, November 28th, is our first block of four games. I'll give you those, and then I want to see where you want to take and what you want to talk about out of the gate. So, LSU at Syracuse, Missouri at Pitt, Mississippi State at Georgia Tech, and Notre Dame at South Carolina. Andy, what do you think about that first quartet of games there? Yeah, I mean, clearly it's not the strongest group. I, mean, I think if we're being honest here, this is th there's some matchups that we're going to talk about a little later on on Wednesday and even later on the day on Tuesday that are a, a bit more appealing. But out of this group, I think it's notable that it's a lot of new ACC coaches. In fact, yeah. all new ACC coaches. Not right? hit. I not still Jeff Capel. Course, yeah, right, but not yep. Syracuse with Autry, Georgia mm -hmm. Tech with Stoudemire, and yeah. Notre Dame with Micah Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury yeah, I, I think it's a, a fun group in the sense of seeing some of these new coaches navigate what may or may not be one of their first kind of big non-conference games. Yep. Uh, again, I, I you know LSU is not exactly a, a huge opponent for Syracuse right off the bat, uh, but I, I think that you got some fun, intriguing matchups here. Not a lot of NCAA tournament resume boosting necessarily going to happen here with one exception and i think that's the missouri pit game i'm really interested to see how that one's going to shake out i think that mizzou has done a really nice job of building a roster in the transfer portal they add caleb grill they add tamar bates they add connor van over the, the big man there from um oral robertson and, and i think that it's going to be an interesting matchup to kind of see I, I think that this is a game let me put it this way where the winner of this game probably is going to look more like an NCAA tournament team. Lenardi's way too early, late late November, early December bracketology is probably going to be moved a little bit by what happens in this game. Whereas, you know, again, without dunking too hard on Notre Dame and South Carolina, that's probably not a game that, you know, Lenardi and the bracketologists are going to need to be watching all of that closely uh, unless one of those teams really surprises us next season. So to me, uh, I think the Missouri at Pitt game is the more notable one in this group, uh, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't intrigued to see what Syracuse does at home against an, a decent opponent in LSU or, or, or what Damon Stoudemire, I'm very excited about him getting a chance yes. to be head coach again. I think uh, uh, he 
Pacific is one of the hardest schools in the entire country to coach at. And he did a decent job of coaching there. And I think that that merits him getting a job like this one at Georgia Tech and, and a chance to play at Christians in Missouri State or excuse me, Mississippi State. Uh, I, I think is going to going to be an interesting one. So while this isn't the best group of games we're going to talk about today, there's some some games that I'm excited about here. Well, and probably part of the reason we're there for all these first year coaches is part yeah. of the reason we're not all excited about it because it right. means it's a program in flux, right? Because yeah. these aren't uh, outside of Syracuse and Bayheim. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not uh, teams that are having new coaches because it's just somebody that retired, right? right. It's because they've been fledgling, and yeah. even in Bayheim's case, that's been true mm -hmm. and so i think that's part of why these matchups aren't all that sexy for us mm -hmm. what's funny about us having all these first year uh of three of these four acc teams being first year all mm -hmm. four of these sec schools are second year coaches <laughs> LSU year and matt mcmahon his second mm -hmm. year dennis gates at mizzou chris jans as you just talked about in mississippi mm -hmm. state mm -hmm. and then obviously the mont paris at south carolina taking over from frank martin and so like we <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of brand new coaches and mm -hmm. Jeff Capel is the elder statesman of yes. this quartet of games. Mm -hmm. Andy, let's move on. I think into mm -hmm. our more uh, appealing games later on. Thankfully we don't mm -hmm. have to wait too long mm -hmm. to get what is probably the crown jewel game of Tuesday night taking place just 30 minutes later. It'll tip off. Mm -hmm. And man, I, I am wildly excited about this game. Mm -hmm. The Miami hurricanes traveling to Rupp arena yeah. to take on what now is a Kentucky Wildcats team that thankfully has added a couple personnel yeah. pieces in recent days. What do you think about this one? The, what a fun matchup. I mean, just, just, uh, you got this veteran laden team in Miami. You got uh, uh, Jim Laranega, you know, taking this team to back to back elite eights, really tremendous success for the Canes and, and a roster that, you know, they add Matthew Cleveland from Florida state. I think that's a huge, <laughs> huge addition for this team. Nigel Pack is of course back. You lose Isaiah Wong. That's difficult. Uh, you lose Jordan, and Jordan Miller. Miller. Yeah, wow. really difficult to lose those two guys. But you have Wuga Poplar, you have Norchad O'Meara back, and I think that this is a team that uh, is primed to make another deep run. Are they going to go back to the Final Four? I'm not uh, willing to make that prediction here in late June, but like <laughs> they're they're going to be a good team. And Kentucky, you know, we've talked a lot, a lot about Kentucky on this show in the last couple of weeks, and certainly they have been the the biggest newsmakers in college basketball. But now, uh, in a matter of days, to go from having virtually no experience on your roster to getting Antonio Reeves back and then adding a really good fit for that roster and Trey Mitchell. I mean, he's exactly what they need, especially with that Aaron Bradshaw injury. I, I think that Cal's never easy to beat at home and Miami's probably on paper, a better roster as we look at it right now. But uh, I, I am not going to Fanduel and putting money on Miami anytime soon in that game, because a lot could change between now and late November. And I'll tell you that uh, Calipari and Kentucky is going to be ready for them at home. Yeah. I think I, I really wish, and I mean, it, it is what it is. I wish this game was flipped and that Kentucky mm -hmm. was the team having to go on the road as, as like yeah. a young team. I think that would have been really mm -hmm. more telling, but I think it is interesting with Miami being the mm -hmm. more veteran team, as you just said, I think they obviously have a better chance of weathering big yeah, blue yeah. nation there inside Rupp. And so I think that's going to make, I mean, mm -hmm make for a really interesting atmosphere. Um, Kentucky will have already obviously played a big time game in the champions classic against mm -hmm. Kansas to yeah. kick off the year. And so they're going to be a little bit battle tested already. Uh, as you said, I'm really curious to see what Aaron Bradshaw's timeline is going to be and mm -hmm. if he'll be back, but boy, they're, they're going to have to rely heavily on, on that veteran leadership in Antonio Reeves and Trey Mitchell in this game at home against that Miami team, that, that should be a lot of fun. I love you pointing out Matthew Cleveland because, mm -hmm. oh boy. Now, Andy, we got two other games wrapping up Tuesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, NC State at Ole Miss, and then at 9.30, no, this is not a football game, Clemson <laughs> at Alabama. And so uh, that might be like kind of the underrated game of, mm -hmm. of Tuesday night in my book, Andy, is Clemson at Alabama. But what, what do you look at at either of these two games? Yeah, Clemson at Alabama is going to be a really fun game. Uh, Clemson obviously lost a good amount of talent from last year's roster, but they also bring some guys back. And He's Alabama, yeah. yeah, exactly. Alabama, you know, they they lose Charles Bediaco. Somewhat surprisingly, obviously not surprised to see Brandon Miller and Noah Clowney out the door. Uh, they go get Grant Nelson. Uh, as far as I know, that's been confirmed, although I it, saw the On Wednesday. Wednesday yes. it was confirmed. Okay, just confirmed that Grant Nelson's going to Alabama, but – uh, that's a, a really big pickup for them. And I think uh, getting to see him, I don't think this will be 
Alabama's first big game. I, I don't have their schedule off the top of my head, but whenever he plays his first big game against the marquee opponent is going to be a pretty intriguing and exciting uh, thing in college basketball. And I think that this is certainly one of those opportunities. Clemson is not a, a, you know, a dominant blue blood or any, or anything, but they were at one point in first place in the ACC last year. And, and certainly a team that I think could give Alabama some trouble. Uh, the fact that this one's at home for the Crimson Tide is a nice advantage for them. So uh, that's an exciting game. I'm leaning Bama obviously in that one. And, and I'm excited to see NC state at Ole Miss too. Uh, Chris Beard, obviously uh, getting a, a, a chance to, to turn this program around. NC State's a program that I think has made some really fun additions, uh, including bringing in a Clemson player in Ben Middlebrooks, as well as uh, MJ Rice from Kansas, DJ Horn from Arizona State. I, I think that NC State's in a, a good spot heading into next year, and I think that's going to be a fun matchup as well. Yeah, and going back to the Bama game, I'm, I'm really curious to see because with them losing both Javon Quinterly and Jaden Bradley in the transfer portal now, it's mm-hmm. like, Man, can that Clemson pressure Brown Brownell get get to them and, and cause some turnovers and things like mm-hmm. that? But speaking of, I think I said this the other day. You and I weren't together, so I'll mm-hmm. say because we haven't talked about it. But mm-hmm. what do you think Jaden Bradley's thinking right now? Like, <laughs> dang it, I should have stayed in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, because yeah. uh, honestly, the the Arizona backcourt is more loaded than the Alabama yep. backcourt. Like, good luck, man. Anyway, <laughs> um, so that that'll be a really interesting matchup. Like you, I think I will take Alabama in. Mm-hmm in that game as well. Um, but yeah, man, I, the, uh, the NC state, what, what's interesting to me about them is they had that really talented three man backcourt last year. Mm-hmm. And um, Kevin Keats has done. So again, has brought in some of those guys that you just talked about that I think will give them that capability again, to replace Turk Smith and Jarkel mm-hmm. Joyner. And so uh, it'd be really interesting to see what happens there. But yes, as, as we've already said, I believe that Miami Kentucky should be the highlight of Tuesday night. Well, Isaac, we got a lot of really fun games coming our way on Wednesday too. We haven't talked about North Carolina. We haven't talked about Duke. We haven't talked about Arkansas. Lots of fun matchups coming up on Wednesday. And we're going to talk about them right after a word from today's sponsor FanDuel. The baseball season is in full swing and there is no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now new customers get a no sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet does not win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to join today. Folks, maybe you want to keep betting on Shohei Otani to either strike out 10 guys or hit a home run because it seems like he's doing one of those two (laughs) things dang near every single time he plays. Either way, don't miss your chance to snag a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Fandle, an official partner of Major League Baseball, and these Major League Baseball trademarks have been used with permission. Oh, thank goodness. All right, folks, I want to thank all of you for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen or your first watch of the day for those of you on YouTube. Shout out to the everyday listeners checking us out wherever you get your podcasts. Or again, on YouTube, we got fun stuff coming your way next week. We're going to talk about the biggest storylines in all of college basketball over the last year. We're also going to continue to keep you updated on the transfer portal happenings. Jordan Brown going to Memphis just happened. We'll be talking about that and anything else that comes up. But for now, we want to keep talking about this ACC SEC matchup. And Isaac, I'm with you. It's hard to say it it doesn't roll off the tongue as well as SEC big 10 or SEC big 12 or whatever uh, the previous iterations have been because ACC, SEC, it's just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for me as well. Regardless, we got some very fun matchups that are coming our way on Wednesday, November 29th, 7.15 p.m. There are three games going on at the, at the same time. And Isaac, I want to get your kind of pulse on these three games. We got Tennessee at North Carolina. We got Texas A&M at Virginia. And then we have Florida at Wake Forest. Talk to me about these three games. Well, I mean, I I think the crown jewel of this one right out of the gate probably has to be Tennessee at North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Both of these teams project ranked preseason. I imagine they both still will be at this point. Um, It's always funny. So for people who might not remember, Rick Barnes used to be in the ACC Mm -hmm. and had some really contentious matchups with the Tar Heels kind of when he was younger and a more like I don't know what you what kind of coach you call him, but you brash. know what brash. There we go. I like that. That is the word. <laughs> and so it's always kind of funny when Rick Barnes goes back to the Dean Dome and how that plays out. But man, this Tennessee team, Andy, should be really, really yeah. good. They get back three of their four scores. I think with 
Mm -hmm. uh, Kamwa leaving, I think a lot of people think, oh, man, it's going to be tough. But mm -hmm. Santiago Vescovi's back. Zakai Ziegler's back. We'll see mm -hmm. if he's ready to go by then with his injury. Yeah. Josiah Jordan James is back. Not to and and I know they lose Julian Phillips as well mm -hmm. to the to the draft, but mm -hmm. get in Dalton Connect, who should be really good. Chris Ledlam, um, and so man, I, I'm really excited to see what Tennessee does. Mm -hmm. uh, North Carolina has dominated this series historically, ten to two all time, but Tennessee gave them a spanking the last time they played two seasons ago in Connecticut. And so uh, I think that that is the the highlight game of this first one, though, mm -hmm. of the first bracket. No, mm -hmm. what am I looking for? Time, time slot, <laughs> whatever. I don't know words, man. <laughs> um, I think the underrated game maybe of all of Wednesday night is Texas A&M at Virginia. Mm -hmm. all, obviously, it's always hard to go to Charlottesville and win. But A&M has the type of veteran guard leadership mm -hmm. that could go in there and sustain what they need to do against Virginia and let's not forget that a certain man that patrols the sideline for Texas A&M has some history as the coach of Virginia Tech mm -hmm. and so knows a little bit about what to do when you have to face Tony Bennett so uh, really curious to see that matchup yeah I think those are two really great matchups and I don't want to completely skate over Florida at Wake Forest which no. I know is uh, probably the less appealing matchup on paper but I'm very excited about this matchup as well I think Riley Kugel is a, a player that's really going to emerge as a potential breakout guy in the SEC next year for Todd Golden at Florida uh, I thought Wake Forest picking up Hunter Salas in the transfer portal was a great great addition and, and just from a offense versus defense perspective Riley Kugel versus Hunter Salas is going to be a really fun matchup in that game uh, the Gators made a ton of fantastic additions in the portal I think that's that's going to be a really fun game but uh, I, I think if you have to pick between the 715 time slots unless you got three screens it's going to be hard to hard to find a way to watch all three of these oh I do well, I there you that. go then we're squared away <laughs> uh, when you get later in the day though you only got well you got three games you got four games actually that you have to worry about at 915 but I suspect that you don't necessarily need all of the screens on for those games at 915 we have the big one Duke at Arkansas what a matchup that's going to be. We'll talk more about that. You also got Virginia Tech at Auburn. You have Georgia at Florida State. And then you have Boston College at Vanderbilt, like I said. Make sure your TV's tuned into at the very least one of these games, uh, maybe two. Isaac, what are you looking for out of this group here? Well, yeah, I'll give you my surprise thing right out of the gate. Boston College at Vanderbilt. Let's not mm -hmm. forget Vandy. Yeah. Coach Stackhouse had them playing really, yeah. really well at the end of last season. And also, Boston College, uh, listen, they're not a historically great basketball mm -hmm. team, and we don't expect that. But um, they had some injuries last year that held them down, getting some of that back like Quentin Post. Um, and so I, I expect that to be kind of a like not under the radar at the same level that I'm excited about AM Virginia. Mm -hmm. But I think that could be a really intriguing game. I know that's weird to say. But yeah, Andy, as you're kind of alluding to there, all mm -hmm. eyes are going to be on Duke at Arkansas. We got the second year of John Shire bringing them to Bud Walton mm -hmm. Arena, the the Arkansas backcourt where I think coach Musselman might be trying to play eight backcourt guys on the court at the same time. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out, but man, um, Arkansas hosting Duke. That is just a fun, fun matchup. Andy Bud Walton arena is about 90 miles South of me. I'm pretty sure I'm going to need to try to get down there for that one. You better, you better be down at that game. That's going to be an absolute blast. If Brazil is healthy for Arkansas too, and they're that's playing at, at or, or near full strength, man, Duke returning four key starters, obviously Roach and the three sophomores coming back. Uh, this is a, an elite, elite non-conference matchup. This is, uh, and we'll talk about this more. I know the the overall kind of feeling about this ACC SEC matchups, and and some of the matchups are are questionable. Some of them just aren't going to be fun because that's just how these things work. But man, when you get Duke and Arkansas on for Duke having to go on play a true road game, that's a really, really, really fun college basketball game. Yeah, and with these other, you know, the two in the middle, er, in the middle there, I say in the middle because they're in the middle on our sheet that we're working off of. But uh, the the two ACC schools there, Virginia Tech at Auburn, and then UGA at Florida State. Mm -hmm. Both of those were were schools last year in the ACC. Virginia Tech that uh, didn't have the year they hoped or anticipated. Same for Florida State. Mm -hmm. Just man, it, it was rough for both of those teams. More so rough for Florida State than it was yeah. for Virginia Tech, I should say. And obviously, as, as we said earlier, Matthew Cleveland leaving 
Florida State to go to Miami. That that's a tough loss. So yeah. I'm really interested to see what Leonard Hamilton's able to do this year and if if they're able to rebound. But uh, hosting Georgia should be a, a nice recipe there. Interestingly, Athens is not too far of a trip down mm -hmm. to Tallahassee. And then Virginia Tech heading to Auburn. Uh, you know that Bruce Pearl always gets uh, the not only his team, but the arena up for those type yeah. of games. Virginia Tech is such a fun team from a guard standpoint. We know that mm -hmm. Auburn's guards are always going. So I, I expect that game to be pretty up and down with a lot, a lot of fun backcourt play. Yeah, unquestionably. Wendell Green, Katie Johnson, I, I think it's going to be a really fun matchup between that backcourt. Denver Jones is a big pickup for Auburn as well, a guy who averaged 20 per game at Florida International. Uh, yeah, I, I'm 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 really excited about that game, but it's going to be something that I'm only watching when there's commercials during the Tuke and Arkansas game because those being at the same time, it's tough. And I think those are going to be some good matchups uh, on a day that otherwise doesn't have great matchups, although I'm with you that Florida State and, uh, and Georgia and Boston College at Vandy at least have some intrigue, but... Hard, hard to beat Duke at Arkansas. Hard to beat it, and I don't think we will. <laughs> Andy, the question, as we move into like some big picture takeaways and thoughts and ideas about this, is this new challenge, is it a step in the right direction? Is it a, a step backwards because of the new media deals? And, of course, we got to pick who we think will win this championship that doesn't actually matter at all, and there's no trophy <laughs> for it. But still, that's fun, and that's why we're here. We'll do that in just a second. Okay, Andy, as, as we've talked about a couple times already, prior to the ACC-SEC Challenge that will start this year, we had for about two decades the ACC Big Ten Challenge and for a decade the SEC Big 12 Challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, there's always changes that, that happens, but, you know, obviously this one has been done because of media rights contracts. Is, is this a step in the right direction? Is it a step in the wrong direction? Or is it just kind of like, who cares, man? It's basketball. Let's go. I think any time that there's large media deals get, get, getting getting involved, <laughs> any time that, that these big companies are getting more involved in these processes and scheduling is done through the lens of media and what ESPN wants, what Fox wants, what's you know CBS wants, et cetera, I think you're getting into territory that's not as good. Like I think if we're using step forward or step back, I think it's a step back. In an absolute vacuum, a challenge between the ACC and the SEC is not a bad thing. Yep. I don't think that it specifically is bad, but I think that the direction that we're heading in, I don't love it. And, and I don't think that a lot of people do, whether you like these matchups or not, you can be pumped about Duke, Arkansas and, uh, you know, Tennessee, North Carolina, and still think that losing these, the ACC, the big 10 challenge, losing the SEC, big 12 challenge, and knowing that the, that these media companies are driving some of these decisions, when we look at conference realignment, which is something that is a hot topic uh, and, and is alienating a lot of people who are maybe unhappy to see certain things happen. And even if you like the moves, like knowing that these things are being driven this way, hmm. it, it's not going to stop. <laughs> like, it's not like, you know, every step we take towards media, having more control over who's playing who and who's in what conference, like, I think it's an objectively bad thing and I don't want to, you know, get all doom and gloom or like sound like <laughs> I'm want to putting a tinfoil hat on or anything because it's not that dramatic. But I think at the end of the day, like we are seeing bigger companies making decisions that are impacting our viewership, like the games that we get to watch. And I, I just, I, while I think that this particular set of games is fine, I don't love that. That's the direction we're trending in. Yeah. Uh, a specific thing that I've been, sad about that I'm bemoaning within my mm -hmm. own internal processing of it is that we just, we're in this era where when we get to conference play, it's just mm -hmm. conference play. Yes. One of the nice breaks from that was mm -hmm. the SEC big 12 challenge. Yeah. Where yeah. at like the ACC big 10 challenge, big 10 mm -hmm. ACC challenge. They, mm -hmm. did you know, they formally flipped the name every other year. So that, anyway, uh, <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, that always occurred like the week after Thanksgiving, the week after mm -hmm. the MTEs were taking place. Right. Um, but the, the big 12 SEC challenge always took place in the midst of conference play. So both mm -hmm. conferences would take a break and that weekend it would just mm -hmm. be those games. Yeah. I loved that. I look forward to it so much. And rather than stepping back from that, I was hoping more conferences would lean into that. And it's something that we used to get a lot more of and mm -hmm. we just don't anymore. And part of that is 20 game conference schedules. Part yeah. of that is just 
you know, a lot of what you were talking about, but, mm-hmm. but I hate that it's another loss of a, a break in the conference schedule for non-con games. So I, that kind of ugh me mm-hmm. as well, but we'll see. I, I'll tell you on that too, uh, speaking from a Gonzaga perspective, uh, the loss of those inner conference games or mi- in the middle of conference, non-conference games uh, is a bummer. Gonzaga used to play Memphis like pretty routinely. Uh, that was uh, in sometimes when Cal was coaching there uh, in like February every year, they picked a cup, picked up a couple other games and then suddenly they just kind of stopped doing those. And, and yeah. certainly the expanded conference schedules for some of the power six teams, contributed to that but for Gonzaga it was a good way to uh, you know get a chance to play a marquee opponent between January and March which is something that they it could it potentially impacts them when they get into March a lot of people believe that and it's hard to argue that it, it doesn't play some kind of role for them and so you know I think it's one of those things that seeing more of that would be good for this sport and, and obviously you know an SEC schedule is going to have good games throughout but it's still nice to play different teams to play different styles to to travel different places I think it's just good for the sport it's good for the fans uh, and it's unfortunate that we're seeing schedules seem to get more kind of rigid in certain ways of like we're going to schedule our MTEs at this time and we're going to schedule this event at this time and we're going to change it because of the media and it's just it's it just feels like it takes a little bit of the fun out of it and I think that's kind of what you you use the word bemoaning and I'll I'll use that as well because I think that's kind of how I feel about it. Well, when the day comes when you and I are named the co-college basketball czars, we will yeah, make this better. A couple of years, right? Yes. Uh, now, Andy, one of my favorite things, like a game I like to play is when these matchups are mm-hmm. announced for whatever these conference matchups are. Mm-hmm. There's always, you know, it for some reason, we can never get it to where it's two conferences with the same amount of teams. So it's always <laughs> a fun game to look at all the matchups and be like, oh, who's missing? Right. So when this popped out on Wednesday, I just worked my, cause I knew the ACC would have one more team than the SEC. So mm-hmm. I just worked my way up the, the Atlantic coast, trying to think through who it was. And Andy Louisville is the team that surprisingly mm-hmm. is left out of this thing, which is wild to think about. But listen, I know the Cardinals should be infinitely better this year yeah. than they were last year. But this is what happens when you just went four and 28 overall Mm -hmm. two and 18 in the ACC and good freak. You finished 290th at Ken Palm. Yeah. Andy Cardinals are going to have to show themselves better this year. And this is a kind of a brutal slap in the face Mm -hmm. that just keeps on reminding them of how bad last year was. Yeah. And I mean, it it had to be them. It had to be them. I I, I do think they're going to be better next year. And I think that you could make an argument that they might be a a more appealing draw than even, you know, somebody like Boston College. Again, no disrespect, but like they might be a more appealing draw just because they had an exciting offseason. They brought in some younger guys, some freshmen coming up. But you can't go four and 28 and two and 18 in league and expect to be <laughs> expect to not be left out of something like this. It's like you said, it's, I don't think that the, the staff is too shocked that they didn't get invited to this. And here's another thing that kind of surprised me about these matchups is I've long expected that when they were announced that we would have either Duke, Kentucky or North mm-hmm. Carolina, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And, and you can't do that every year. Like I get it. You gotta, you gotta share the love around, but for, for heaven's sake, this is the inaugural one. Like, I yeah. feel like you got to put like two mm-hmm. of the bluest blue bloods in our land together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you might push back and say, well, what about the Champions Classic? Duke and yeah. Kentucky might be playing there. Well, they're not. Kentucky's playing Kansas. Duke's playing Michigan State. Right. So they're not scheduled to play each other. You could have done that. Carolina and Kentucky are both in the CBS Sports Classic. Mm-hmm. There's been conflicting reports about the matchups there. I've heard both. UCLA versus North Carolina and Kentucky versus North Carolina. So if it's Kentucky, North Carolina, that's obvious, but Mm -hmm. you still could have gone Duke in Kentucky. And I just feel like for, for the first year of this thing, you Mm -hmm. gotta go with one of those to be as, as flashy as you possibly Mm -hmm. can for starting a new thing. Right. I'm surprised that the media uh, overlords didn't demand it. <laughs> for being perfectly honest, like I'm surprised that it wasn't uh, a requirement in order to to put this together to have a, a Duke Kentucky matchup or a or a Kentucky Carolina matchup. Obviously, Miami at Kentucky is a very exciting game, but it's not. 100%. It's not true blue bloods, and Miami is not what you'd consider a traditional blue blood, and obviously Duke and Carolina are. And so it, it's an interesting to to not see that matchup. And we talked about mm-hmm. Kentucky getting that to be a home game for them, which is a nice little advantage. They also play Gonzaga at home this year, and I kind of lean in your direction that they probably should have played one of those games on the road to get these freshmen prepared for what that's going to look like. Um, but they will never play Gonzaga on the road anyway, so I guess it's not going to matter. <laughs> 
<laughs> Spokane Arena. Is that where it was last year? Yes, it was. Spokane Arena. <laughs> that joke will never get old. Nope. <laughs> uh, so, Andy, I know we got to get out of here. We're running short on time. Mm-hmm. But, but we can't talk about a challenge and not pick a champion. Mm-hmm. Of course, we're going to get a soccer result, and it's going to be a 7-7 tie. But <laughs> who are you going with? SEC, ACC, or PUSH? I, it's, I think it's going to be close. Uh, I'm, I'm leaning SEC, uh, I, I think, for, for a couple key reasons. I think Arkansas has a big advantage being at home. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's going to be a massive game. If Arkansas beats Duke, that really helps them uh, potentially advance in that. Uh, Tennessee at North Carolina is another big one. Obviously, the Tar Heels at home, they get an advantage there. But that Tennessee team is really, 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 really good. Uh, and looking forward, you know, I, I think – Florida has a chance to take a, a road game against Wake Forest. I think that's going to be a good matchup, but a, a possibility there. I think uh, Alabama probably beats Clemson at home. Uh, Kentucky might steal one against Miami because they're at home. So to me, I think if it were to fall in an uneven way, I think the SEC has a couple advantages that make me think it could be something like 9-5, but I think it's going to be pretty close. Yeah, I think so too. And I, I was tempted to to go through and like evaluate each game mm-hmm. and pick a winner, but I just wanted to go based on conference strength. And I know the yeah. SEC has been coming up and the ACC has mm-hmm. been kind of down, Yeah, but I'm projecting the ACC to have a much better year this year. Mm-hmm. And so just based on that alone, and again, at some point I need to go through and pick a winner of each game, but mm-hmm. I'm going to lean just slightly the other way. I'm going to go ACC 8-6 or 9-5. But just like you said, it wouldn't shock me in any way to see it flip the other way. Well, Isaac, very, very fun chance to talk about the ACC SEC Challenge. Going to be some really fun basketball games coming our way in late November this upcoming season. But that is going to do it for us today and for this week. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to listen to Locked On College Basketball Podcast. Shout out to the everyday listeners who are checking us out daily on YouTube or wherever else you get your podcasts. We've got a lot of fun stuff coming your way next week, so don't miss out. Thank you all for listening. And of course, as always, peace.